Good evening, guys. Fix my hair. <clears throat> I'm just going to give everyone a minute to arrive, get some confirmation that you can hear me, and then we are going to jump in. Oh, I see myself. Great. Let's jump in. You know how I like to just jump right in. Share my screen. <clears throat> oh, uh, can you guys hear me? I should have checked on that first. Just a second. I have having some issues. Let me switch it to this just so I have the full screen. And let me check and see. Can you go? Yes. Okay, great. All right, then we're going to jump in. Okay, so I thought I was pretty much finished with all of the surprises. I have been through most of the FOIA docs, but the next live, I was planning on covering my biggest surprises. I might need to rejigger that a little bit because there are genuinely so many surprises that have come from the FOIA docs. But I thought it was down to the last 60 pages. Turns out I must have searched for something and I was actually down to the last 200 pages. But those last 200 pages took me a really long time to get through. Sometimes a single page can just literally take me hours because I'm like cross-referencing and looking up search warrants, IDs, and you know, all kinds of things. So I, but I still pretty much thought like, all right, I, th I think I have a pretty good grasp and I can say without hyperbole, this thing that I found out uh, yesterday was really, really surprising to me enough that, I, you know, at first I was like, oh, just give yourself the weekend off and, you know, I can just cover it with the other surprises. But I felt like it, it was entangled enough that it kind of required its own life. So, and I said from the beginning, like the cadence is going to be every other week for the actual lives, but I might jump in from time to time if I find something especially compelling and I found something that I believe was especially compelling. So what we're going to be talking about tonight is who told Lori the plan. So the FOIA docs actually reveals that. And so, but it also requires a little bit of background because I never want to assume that you know, everyone listening to the live is in the group and is following the case cl closely. So I try not to assume prior knowledge as much as possible. All right, before we get started, uh, the other mods and I have talked about one of the things that we're a little bit concerned about is sometimes how much the focus in the chat can turn toward the Facebook group, which is called uh, Cool Cats and Criminals. It's a Facebook group that I run with a handful of um, admins, and we really kind of dig into the case. And some of the things that I can't really go into too much on a public forum, just because I want to be responsible, especially with conjecture. Having said that, there is going to be conjecture in this live, but I'm a little more careful to, you know, kind of... <clears throat> set the stage for it. And, uh, but anyway, so I can be a little more free in a private group because I don't have to be concerned about, you know, like if someone Googles, someone we're talking about material in that group is not going to show up. And that is my primary concern. So having said that, please don't turn the focus of this live or any live to the group. If you want to apply to the group, you know, I don't promote the group in the lives because I just don't want to be accused of having any other motive other than just putting information out. I, I, I'm not trying to build a large group. We actually keep it pretty small. And, and sometimes 
when we find out that like, for example, uh, like let's say an admin or a mod let in a bunch of socks, we'll go through and kind of, you know, pick through the group. So sometimes people are removed from the group just because their accounts are so locked down that they look like a sock puppet and a sock puppet is just a fake account or an alternate account. And we don't allow those in the group. So anyway, if you want to learn more about the group, you can go to bit.ly CCC for cool cats and criminals FB group. If you've been booted from the group, please don't ask what you did. You didn't do anything. I mean, really the only reason people are booted for the group for conduct is if they, or the most common reason is if they just can't adhere to the rule of no disrespecting other people's religion. <clears throat> then, you know, these victims did not die because of a religious beliefs of an established church. The, this was a cult. And uh, I've been in these groups now long enough, only since this case, and I will never follow a criminal case after this. Again, one and done. But uh, the I, I've seen groups just really go off the rails and just start, you know, accusing people and saying really cruel things. And we just want to stick to the topic of the crimes, the criminals, and the facts. So anyway, if you were booted, most likely it was not because of anything you did. It was probably because of the day that you were accepted. You might have been led into the group with a whole bunch of sock puppets on a day where there was a, you know, a, a large number of sock puppet accounts let in, <clears throat> excuse me, for one reason or another, or because you just have a really locked down account. But we're going through the, the you know, so anyway, if you have been booted, Go to bit.ly forward slash arctic feline. That is our admin account. And um, just send a friend request to that account and someone will get to you. Okay. As always, if you haven't been to a live before, one of the, the, the two people on the screen right now, these are the two people who have my heart the most. Um, this is my brother and my niece, Tylee. I believe that they were both victims. Um, Joe's death was never investigated. And so I started um, I, I started this petition to uh, try to appeal to Phoenix police to just investigate his death. So uh, if you are so inclined to sign the petition, bitly justice for Joe, JSTC for Joe. Thank you. Okay. Now, the topic at hand, it all started with an email. So there's quite a bit of backstory here and there were a lot of details. So what I decided to do was just so that we don't kind of get lost in all the minutia, it is, I, I didn't include all of the text exchanges that took place on the three to four days in question that lead up to the mole, let's just say. Um, so I just broke them down chronologically. So um, you'll see this calendar and, and then you'll actually see a little clock with a time for each of the text messages, just because I think it'll help show like where Charles' mind was, and um, and that plays into the events that transpired uh, following on the heels of these text messages. So we're going to start with June 29th. So Charles found an email on Lori's computer. Now, this was Lori's laptop, and she had left it in Texas. So sometime in the spring, she had moved back in with Charles. So she moved to Houston, Texas, <clears throat> excuse me. And she had told her friend, Melanie Gibb, that she, uh, or Melanie Gibb claims that Lori told her that she was moving in to get Charles finances in order. So and that, that's what Melanie Gibb, I think she said that on Dateline. Mm. 
So, and there are all kinds of really sketch things that happened while she was in Texas. We will get into that in another live, but like one of her friends or well, two of her friends said that she was putting medication in Charles smoothie. She was reporting to another friend that he was getting weaker. One friend later, I personally feel like this is some revisionist history, um, but she was like, oh yeah, it was Xanax to help him chill out. <clears throat> do I believe that? No, I absolutely do not believe that. But she was putting something in his smoothies. I mean, there was all kinds of stuff going down. Like before, she, the day before she moved back, uh, Charles was doing a search for how to delete messages. So they were both kind of like battening down the hatches. But Lori, at this point in her criminality, was not technically savvy at all. Now, she was technically savvy enough to know how to use Venmo. And we will cover that in a future live. So there was, there was a family member who said that she didn't know how to use Venmo because she wasn't technically savvy. She wasn't that un, that that uh, technically unsavvy, <clears throat> but she cr crimin. Uh, she didn't have a a sophisticated criminal mind. She was very much like a, a chaotic criminal largely led by emotion and um, and was just so used to getting away with everything that she relied more on that. Okay, having said that, now that we've kind of established what was going on while she was in Texas, it's very surprising to me that she would leave and leave her laptop there. But she did. And at one point, Charles was like, listen, because she thought that he and Brandon had hacked into her email and he was like, you literally left your computer on the kitchen counter, you know, for anyone to get into. So she left her computer, according to Charles, her laptop on, well, in the home. He went on to her laptop and found an email that she had created a, a fake email for Charles. It was like an account that was close to his, but it wasn't quite his email address. And she had sent an email from this, you know, supposedly from Charles to Chad, inviting him to come to Phoenix. And this was so that he could show his wife, you know, hey, you know, I am, I'm needed. The Lord needs me in Phoenix. So this is what the email said. <clears throat> Hello, Chad. I hope you are doing well. This is Charles Vallow from Arizona. We really enjoyed having you stay with us back in November when you came to the Preparing a People conference. I appreciated you taking time to talk with me about the book I've been working on. Well, more than six months later, I still haven't made much progress on it, but I feel an urgency to get it done. As the managing partner of Wright Planning Group, and that was the, the, the company that Charles was a managing partner of, I'm going to have the opportunity to speak at various conventions beginning in the fall, but everyone says I need to have a book available that summarizes my life and shares the principles I follow. So I will cut to the chase. I'm willing to pay you well to help me get this book into shape as my ghostwriter. I really liked your autobiography and the tone you took in sharing experiences without preaching. Is there any way you could come here for a couple days and help me get the book underway? I feel talking in person would be much more valuable than a phone call or video chat, mainly because I would like to read, I would like you to read through some of my journals and explain to me how the publishing industry works. It would help me to know whether I truly have a book in me and whether you want to team up on it. I played minor league baseball and have plenty of stories that my audience could relate to, along with the knowledge I've gained running my own company. So I do feel the book would contain valuable information even beyond the convention circuit. I'm out of town until Saturday, but I will, would gladly fly you down here early next week before the holiday and cover your expenses. You could stay in our guest room like before or in a hotel if you prefer. I hate to take you away from your family, but I know this book is vital to my speaking success. I understand if you don't want to take part in the project, but I would definitely make it worth your time. 
with admiration, Charles. <clears throat> so this is the infamous email that uh, just opened up Pandora's box. So we don't know what time he found the email, but at 547 that morning, he started firing off emails or uh, was this an email? No, this was a text, sorry. He texts Lori and says, why would you send a letter with my name on it to your Chad? He is not saying at my house, I will be there to make damn sure he doesn't. You have literally lost your mind. You will, I think he meant be stopped. So that was 547. A few minutes later, well, you can tell like his, his head is spinning. His, he, he's trying to absorb this and he starts sending these text messages rapid fire. So he texts her again. Is he with whom you're having an affair? He did not stay with us in Arizona in November. So that's a pretty critical insight. Well, it's not critical, but it is insightful that clearly when we know that Charles had left with JJ when a group of their friends all stayed at Lori's house and Chad was part of that group and they, they had just met at a conference just a few weeks beforehand. And so clearly Lori didn't tell Charles that, that a man would also be staying there. I don't know if she told him anyone would. Uh, yeah, I think actually, it, I think he knew. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I included that text, but he, or no, it was an email to Adam. If I didn't, it's kind of funny because he he makes a reference to the only people who stayed there were her really weird friends. I was like, I feel you, Charles. Anyway, okay. So back to the text. Who are you lying to now? Trying to destroy another family? You're evil, period. I may take JJ back to Houston unless you have a great explanation for all this. I will not let him be a party to your apostasy. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I meant to look that up afterwards after the last chat. Uh, okay. So a few minutes later, this is at 604. Just so you know, I have Tammy's Chad's wife email address. I will send a copy of quote, my email you sent to, and I mean, obviously that was Chad. I don't know about why that was redacted. Oh, I think it, yeah. Cause that's too short to be an email. Anyway, Tammy will know what you're up to. You better explain. 610, so there's a few minutes later. I now have Tammy Daybell's cell number. So, I mean, he was in research mode. He was digging and trying to find as much information as he could. And I think in one source it said that he found it on a website. So, who knows? I'll text her a copy of the letter and an explanation of what you're up to. You have till noon your time to explain or I'm sending via text and an email to her. So kind of tuck that time away. It's 610, he's saying she has until noon. Now it's 640, so 30 minutes later, you know, you can tell he's kind of in obsession mode, a mode I can obviously very much relate to. Uh <clears throat> excuse me. And he says, or I might just go up to Idaho like you did in March. So now he's digging through her, her computer. This has been verified. She did go to Idaho in March. So it doesn't appear she's woken up yet, or at least she hasn't replied yet. But when she does wake up and when she first sees this, I'm sure she's like in panic mode because she's somewhat defenseless because she, she can't lock down her laptop. Well, you you actually can, but she probably wouldn't know how to do that. Okay, so, or I might go up to Idaho like you did in March and visit Tammy at her school. I'm sure she'd love to know the whole story of what you and her husband have been up to. Librarians aren't usually that busy. You need to explain why you're writing emails in my name. Now it's 6.55. 
I'm sure you're up by now. You have until 10 a.m. your time to respond or I send the emails and text to Tammy. Uh, and then it says, I examined the data and noticed that there was not much activity in reference to this case until 629. We will talk about that in another live. That's just such a ridiculous statement just kind of trickled in here. Like they, they pulled Charles' uh, data from his phone and someone was like, yeah, there's not really anything relevant to the case until like you know, just a couple of weeks before he was murdered. Uh, but they even referenced like there was, you know, there were escalating tensions in their marriage that year and, and stuff. So anyway, foreshadowing. As indicated above, this was the day that Charles discovered the relationship between Lori and Chad. In reviewing the data, I saw Charles sent the letter from, and I know from another, I, I'm pretty sure in another, um, another document, it actually said he sent it from one email address to another of his email address. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it was like from his Gmail to his iCloud account or something like that. But it was at seven o'clock. So his last text to her had been at 650. Now he's like, you know what, I better, I better forward this. Um, but uh, I, I, he might have actually sent it from her email to his. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm thinking of something else. Anyway. All right. Let me make sure I have this right. Yeah. Okay. So now at 8, 11 a.m., Charles sent a text to Adam and Adam was saying like, you know, you should hire a, a private investigator to you know, catch them in this illicit affair. And, um, you know, you need more proof. And, and Charles told him, I don't need any more. Let her deny it because, you know, Adam had said she's going to deny it. He said, let her deny it. I'm going to the next event and putting it all on flash drive and handing it out to the 2000 attendees. So this doesn't sound like he's planning on going to like a preparing a people event. This sounds like a larger um, like LDS event. <clears throat> Excuse me. Maybe I think it's called like general conference, maybe something like that. I don't know, but a larger event. Let them make up their own mind and see who's preaching to them about our church and how beautiful families are how, and how beautiful families are while having an affair. Uh, I did. I think he was just texting kind of fast and furious there. It'll be so much fun. He'll probably sell more books, but not for the reason he likes. I've already contacted his wife. So he says that 8, 11. So he didn't give her till until 10 a.m. He said, I've already contacted his wife. Now, according to the FOIA docs, he actually hadn't contact, contacted her yet because I think Phoenix time is UTC minus seven. Because I know uh, New York is UTC minus five. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so either mm, there's a date wrong in the FOIA docs or a time wrong in the FOIA docs or he was just telling Adam what he was going to do. But he said, I've already contacted his wife. It should be real interesting when I speak with her on Monday. So he's telling... Charles on the 29th that he is scheduled to talk to Tammy on Monday at July 1st. So a little while later, we're, we're still on the 29th is 839. Now Charles sent an email to Adam and included the, um, uh, the fraudulent letter <clears throat> but then he also said, Adam, open this letter and see what she did. I'm not sure if the relationship with her and Chad Daybell, not, I think he meant, I'm not sure of the relationship with her and Chad Daybell, but they are up to something. She created an email alias for me as I've never set this one up. She sent this yesterday. So Charles caught it the next day. So she sent this email on the 28th. 
He found it early, early in the morning on the 29th, I'm assuming. Uh, okay, she sent this yesterday, and I guess she forgot all her emails are on the computer at my house. I asked her to explain it, and she started blaming you, Brandon, and me for perpetuating a scheme against her. Just more of her paranoia. She will not explain it. I am going to send it to Chad Dable's wife. Her name is Tammy, and I found her email address on their website. I've got her cell number two. Sounds very suspicious to me. What do you think? Whenever she gets caught doing this kind of stuff, she starts blaming everybody else. He definitely had her nailed in that regard. I wish you luck trying to help her. I was the one brave enough to try to get her help in January, and look what happened to me. The whole family put a scarlet letter on me. Maybe now they can see what they're up against. So we're still on the 29th. Now it's 916. So Charles, and it, there was a, a document in one place saying that like he had given her until the end of the day. We don't have that text or email. It just said that he said she had the and until the end of the day to come clean. And so I don't know if he updated it to 10 a.m. or, you know, uh, or or what, but um, he had updated that to 10 a.m. At this point, he hadn't heard back from Lori yet. And I think he just decided that's it. I'm I'm moving forward. So he sends an email to Tammy and it said, Tammy, my name is Charles Vallow. I have some vital and disturbing information regarding your husband and my wife, Lori. This is your work email. So I'll wait to send you the evidence that is very disturbing. You may call or email me from the address where you can receive the information. I apologize to be the one sending this, but something has to be done. I feel it's best if I shed some light on the issue regards Charles Fallow, and then he probably left his phone number. So that was at 916. Now at 932, he sends an, an, an email to Chad and, um, in informing him that he was aware Lori had sent an email asking him to come to Arizona to go, ghostwrite a book that he was working on. Charles told Chad that he was not working on a book and that he or Lori needed to explain what was going on or he would expose them. Now, he had actually already taken the first step to expose them. Charles also mentioned that he was aware Lori had sent him dance videos of her and that this was not appropriate. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he had actually forwarded uh, in March, he had forwarded the email with the ratings of her family members, as well as uh, some of these recordings of her dancing um, to K. So we know that he had them as at least as far back as March. So now it's June 30th. Again, this is this is first thing in the morning. Oops, there we go. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is at five o'clock in the morning. Charles sends Lori a message. Be sure to look over your shoulders today. This may be the day. It's coming that much, I promise you. So you can tell Charles has ruminated over this all day, the day before, and he didn't get a response from her. And so now it's, it's escalated. Charles sent another message at 5.04 that read, and your boyfriend too. And... Oops, that, that was a mistake. Uh, there is no indication that Lori responded to these text messages on 6.30 at 6.22. Charles sent another message to Lori that read, you will reap the destruction you have sown. I will be, I'll be there for JJ. Don't worry about that. Have a wonderful day being a hypocrite in church. So 
One thing I will say, just out of fairness to Summer, I am no fan of Summer, uh, but one of the things that I think she was telling the truth about was that she had uh, said that she saw threatening messages from Charles to Lori. I'll read that part of the interview. Summer then transitioned into the death of Charles Vallow. She indicated that in the end of June, she was at Lori's Chandler residence, um, helping Lori put patio furniture together. During this time, Lori showed Summer text messages that were coming in from Charles. These text messages ranged from Charles wanting to talk about a bill to telling Lori that her end is coming and days were numbered. Lori, I mean, so Summer told Lori that these texts were not okay. Lori told Summer that he was just on a rant and that it would be fine. Okay, so now there, oh, you know what? I'm sorry, I got these out of order. So on the 29th, so this is before the 30th, there was back and forth between Charles and Lori. Um, I might not, let me see. Yes, I I, I need to, I, after the, there, there was a lot of back and forth after the live, I actually, I'll, I'll go back and just paste those in to the presentation. I always include a link to the presentation and I actually meant to include those. Uh, I was preparing for this up to the last minute, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, but there was back and forth between, so I misspoke. There was back and forth between Charles and Lori on the, the 29th uh, and it had started um, somewhere around, I think around the nine something or 10, I, I'll include those. Okay. So, um, at eight 42, cause it, so it says, once again, there is no indication that Lori responded. Now this is to the, the, uh, threatening text. This is on the 30th. Uh, then Charles sent, Lori, this text, and this is more of an appeal. He says, Lori, I know you don't much care how I feel, but just imagine this. How could my actions or breaking your heart result in what you've done? You accuse me of infidelity, but it's you who have been having an affair. It just keeps killing me. Maybe that's your goal. How can you live with destroying our life? Mel and Brandon's probably Mel and Brendan too. So he was somewhat cognizant of the fact that, uh, that Melanie Gibb and Brendan were having some kind of relationship breakdown. Maybe someone passed that on to him, or maybe he was just predicting that that's what she would do because that's what she does. Anyone who is, Married to someone who wasn't in the group, she just started kind of chipping away at their marriage because I think ultimately they wanted everyone to be married to other group members. And I think what they were ultimately going for was this tent city. I mean, I spent months trying to figure out what was the ultimate goal. And I actually think the tent city was the ultimate goal. I will have a live about that. Okay. Back to our regularly scheduled program. Now add Chad Dayball family and you've got a home run. The fact that you continue to go to the temple after all you've done shocks even me. There, is, there, there really is something wrong with you. I really don't want to do what I have to do, but you have to be exposed for what you really are. You won't even deny it or talk to me as to your reasons. That's what's amazing to me. You could allay some of what's about to happen, but I don't think you will. Lying has become second nature to you. You have been impressive in blaming me for all that's happened. You have destroyed me. I have never been lower in my life. It's you that has done it. Please tell me why. Please. I will slow or minimize what's about to happen. It's you who has caused it. We have a son to raise, but that's all we have in common. I will work with you in his best interest and will be there Monday evening. You owe me an apology for all the false accusations you've made. 
you know I've been entirely faithful to you since the day we met. I deserve an apology from you. Uh, please respect that much. Okay, so then there's this note, and then this was, well, this was surprising to me. So we ha have always known that Charles sent an email to Tammy Daybell, but I found out in the FOIA doc, he actually emailed her twice. So this is kind of Charles M.O. He, he, he's kind of like Columbo, and I've been teased that I can be like a Col Columbo, you know, just kind of coming back. And one more thing, ma'am, you know, uh, because you say something, you make a statement, and then you think about it, and, you know, you, you go back. And so it appears that is what happened here. So we already knew that he sent an email to Tammy on the 29th, but then he sent a follow-up email on the 30th. And um, in the first email, he provided a phone number to call so he could provide more details of the affair. In later conversations with Adam, Charles indicated he was scheduled to speak with Tammy Daybell on Monday, July 1st. There was no indication what method of communication they would use. During the mentioned time, Tammy Daybell was using the telephone number and they um, put that phone number. Now, I don't want to get too far off topic here, but it it was notable to me that in Chad's preliminary hearing, Tammy's cell phone data, I believe, I meant to double check this, but I believe it started on like July 30th or the 31st. So they only had, I mean, I'm sure once they, you know, um, got a search warrant for if she was an iPhone user. Uh, no, I think she was actually an Android user, but I'm sure eventually they um, also ordered the, the cloud data. But at, at that time, they were discussing her actual phone. And I just thought that that was notable because people were like, oh, well, maybe she got a new phone. But you know, all of these smartphones, they're backed up to the cloud, whether it's Google or, you know, iCloud, everything is backed up. So even if you get a new phone, that doesn't mean your data starts over. So this is an indicator that either her, she changed her number and more likely Chad changed her number or he wiped her phone. And this here, I might be looking too much into it, but I, I just think it, it was kind of interesting that they said that they qualified that during the mentioned time she was using this one particular number. So it just kind of, you know, these are things I just kind of like tuck away, like, huh, all right, now I'm leaning a little bit more toward he changed her number. So he might have been concerned that he, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But anyway. Just tuck that away. Okay, now we're moving ahead to July 2nd. And I will reference July 1st, but we're going by the evidence trail here. Oops. Uh, did I miss something? Okay. Yeah. I think I missed a, a screenshot. So uh, let me just, nope. I, I, um, I missed a, a screenshot. So there was a, a, a screenshot of, and I might've just moved it to the wrong slide, um, or might've just left it out altogether, but there was a screenshot of, um, Charles telling, Adam, was it? I think there was a screenshot of him telling Adam that he was um, planning to talk to her on the first, but there was something that happened on the second. I will go back, and if it's not in here, I will go back and add it. This is the risk of these kind of ad hoc lives. All right. So let's cut to the chase here. Who told Lori? That is actually addressed. So it says the evidence above would indicate that Chad had found out the intervention was going to occur. Now, this is 
where Chandler police, is, you know, whoever is writing this part of the report kind of posits their theory. It is believed that this knowledge would have come from communication between Charles Vallow and Tammy Dayball. So they're oper operating under the assumption that Charles and Tammy did speak on the first because they were scheduled to speak on the first. So fair enough. It is therefore requested. And uh, I think, yeah, this was in the context of um, they were ordering a, a search warrant. It is therefore requested that a search warrant be granted for the following accounts between the time period of 628-2019 and 1019. So this would be from the day that uh, Lori sent this email to Chad to the day Tammy died. So I think they were expanding the scope of a previously ordered search warrant. Yes. <laughs> the reason for the extended time frame following the death of Charles Vallow is being requested is based on Lori Vallow's actions. As indicated above, she drafted a fraudulent letter in the name of Charles Vallow to try and bring Chad Daybell to town. Charles Vallow reached out to Tammy Daybell to speak with her about the affair. Lori had access to Charles' email accounts and it is suspected that she could have made additional communication to Tammy under the name of Charles Vallow after his death to cover up the affair. The date of 10-19-2019 is the date of Tammy Daybell's death, in which Chad Daybell and Alex Cox are suspected of committing. Okay, so, again, at the risk of hubris on my part, I will just posit that I believe that there is a fatal flaw in the logic. Now, when I first read it, I called my ride or die. I was just like, you're not going to believe who the, you know, the FOIA doc says, you know, like the, um, uh, told Lori about the intervention. And, you know, it was just kind of shocking that, like, this would come from Tammy, who then told Chad, and Chad told Lori. But as we were talking, you know, we were both like, this, this just doesn't make sense. Like, you know, you start, like, thinking about it, like, as, as a human. And I, I, I'm not saying it's inhuman to believe. I mean, th there's certainly merit to... The, their theory, and they also have access to far more information than I do. However, I, I'm going to posit my theory. So if, so they're operating under the assumption that they, one, they don't know, and we already knew that. We already knew that they couldn't confirm if Charles and Tammy had actually ever spoken. So there's kind of this vague reference that I read, like that they didn't know the, the method. However, if they had talked on the phone, they would know the method because that would have been in Charles' phone records. So I, I'm just, you know, just kind of picking away at this. I think it's reasonable to assume that they didn't talk on the phone unless you're assuming like they both had burner phones, but they weren't being sketchy. So they had no reason to have burner phones. Although Chad did have a, a I mean, I'm sorry, Charles did have a second line. Um, I'm pretty sure like that has uh, come up in the FOIA docs. I am about 95% sure on that, but, um, but the minimum time lapse, so uh, I'll forward to the next, no, okay. So we know that they were supposed to talk. So let's assume that they talked on July 1st. Lori wouldn't have taken control of Charles' email account until the 11th at minimum. And that was just if like during the brief period, and we don't know how long she had access to Charles' phone, but we know it started around a little afternoon because that's when Adam's uh, text messages were marked as red. It was just a, a little bit after 12 Arizona time. 
And then we know that detect when they stopped by the house. So we don't, I don't think we know the time that they stopped by the house. They wanted a change of clothes. Detective Yinklin said, no, you can't go into the house. But by the way, we can't find Charles phone and they handed over his phone. So we don't know how long Lori had access to Charles phone and what would have been the priority. So, but at minimum, like the earliest she would have access, had access to his emails, according to what's written in the FOIA docs, because there's, there's no record of her accessing his emails, um, you know, uh, in, in the FOIA docs, because I've now been through every page of the FOIA docs. And that doesn't mean I'm above error. There was a, I mean, there were uh, total it, among all of these FOIA docs coming out of Arizona, I would say maybe several thousand pages. I don't say that to be self-congratulatory. I'm just saying there's, there's definitely room for error on my part, but there was no reference to anything that indicated that she had control of his email address uh, before, before he died. And they, it, you know, actually mentions that, um, uh, where was it? Um, Lori had access to Charles' email accounts and is suspected that she could have made an additional communication to Tammy under the name of Charles Fallow after his death. So uh, more, more than likely, the 13th would have been the minimum date because that's when Lori and Colby went, they uh, flew to Houston. It was, I think they were there. The they were just there overnight, and it says that they worked through the night. But they collected all of Charles' uh, um, digital devices, so including his like his iMac, his um, it, you know whatever else he had there. They collected those, and while she was there, she was rifling through his um, th through his records. So we will talk more about that, but <clears throat> let's just assume the 11th. So their theory would assume that Charles and Tammy talked on the first. And we also know that Tammy deleted that email. I forget if I included that. Yeah. It says the Sugar Salem School District was contacted to see if this email content was available. I was informed that the Fremont County, Fremont County Sheriff's Office made the same request. It was reported that the email thread was deleted out of her mailbox and that she either deleted it after reading it or did not read the email and deleted it. Regardless, the email was not available. No search warrant is necessary in this case. So, so their theory would require that Tammy would have talked with Charles, would have found out about this elaborate plot for uh, Chad to travel to Arizona. And at the same time, it would have called into question a lot of his other travel. You know, And she also at one point had made the statement that Tammy was her friend. So she may have actually met Tammy so, you know, hearing that name, I mean, it, it, you know, it just seems to me like whoever, whoever was writing this report either maybe didn't put a whole lot of thought into this or has never been cheated on or just doesn't understand like the basics of the human psyche. Like that would take an extraordinary amount of self-control to just like hold on to this information 10 days to not reach out to her family, to not react in any way that we're aware of. Now, we're not going to get FOIA docs from Idaho. So there's a lot of information that we just can't stitch together. However, I just find this assumption like, oh, oh, well, they talked, uh, Tammy heard about this affair, deleted the email, 
didn't like forward it to a personal account first and deleted it. Well, may have forwarded to a personal account. We don't have, I don't know how much Arizona had access to the uh, data that was ordered by Fremont County. But there's there's no record of that. But that she would then delete the email and like everything would just kind of stay calm, you know, for relatively calm for 10 days. <clears throat> Excuse me. With her not sending out any alarms. So here's my theory. Here's here's where I talked about. Um, here's where I dropped this information. By way of reminder. We know that Charles told Lori at 6.04 a.m. on the 29th that he had Tammy's email address and that he was going to forward this email to her. And, uh, and it wasn't for another few hours before Charles sent an email, the actual email to Tammy. So that's three hours of kind of lead time. And I am disappointed that I just, I didn't include the back and forth between Lori and, and Chad. So like I said, I, I will, I will add those in, but uh, my theory is I think that when Lori saw the threat about uh, reaching out to Tammy I think she called Chad. This was an urgent call. And I think Chad had enough of a heads up to be on the lookout for Tammy's email, whether it was, you know, I mean, people will frequently access work email from a personal device or, you know, like a, a laptop at home or, you know, a desktop computer at home. But I suspect that he was the one who intercepted uh, the email. And I suspect that he deleted it and Tammy never actually saw this email. And another curious detail. Um, oh, yeah, this was on uh, July 1st. So on July 1st, Lori sent Charles a text asking what his plan was with JJ and if he was planning on flying with him on July 2nd. Charles responded, I'm going to Idaho first to meet with Tammy Daybell. Lori responded, she won't see you. She is my friend. She won't listen to you. Go ahead. You are ridiculous. Are you coming for JJ for the 4th or not? So... So he's saying that he's going to, he's, he's still insisting that, that like now he's actually going to fly to Idaho and meet with Tammy. But Lori seems really confident that Tammy's not going to talk to him and she wasn't going to meet with him. So where am I going with this? So this was the curious detail, actually. So I had filed this away. I read this a little while ago. My Adam had asked uh, Charles, you know, when when Charles said that he was going to talk to Tammy on July first, he asked, "What did Chad Daybell wife say?" So this was on the second, and Charles said nothing. Lori says flashes her friend. I think he meant um, Lori says she's her friend. Lori says, I'm crazy. She also says, I wrote the email. Go figure. She has no limits to what she will say to accomplish her mission, whatever the hell that is. There are a number of things I have her dead rights on lying about. I have given up. There's nothing I can do as summer your mom and dad won't even acknowledge me. Adam, I'm the only one who loves her enough to try to do something. Look what happened to me. I'm an outcast and I've done nothing wrong. So the curious thing was this was on July 2nd. So this was the day after they were supposed to talk. Lori says Tammy Daybell is her friend. I think Tammy and her husband are some of the ringleaders. 
Just look at the emails he writes. They are a bunch of crazies and have made a mockery of our gospel. So where am I going with this? I suspect that Chad, before deleting the emails, or yeah, I suspect, question, I wonder if he first replied it, it, like on on the the first or somewhere in here, he replied to Charles harshly, and and it just seems like now like something happened that suddenly made Charles think that Tammy is a ringleader too. So something caused that impression. Now he doesn't want. It appears he doesn't want to tell. Adam, what actually happened? Um, maybe he doesn't want to admit that his plan failed or, you know, I mean, I'm sure he was dealing with some disappointment. And I think ultimately he was, he was sincerely trying to put an end to all of this just insanity. And we know that <clears throat> the plan, you know, leading up to his death was to get the president involved and the, the, the bishop um, and have her excommunicated. And he does say in one of his messages to someone that, you know, he hoped that the excommunication would bring her to repentance. But I think this was something made him feel pretty dejected and made him conclude, no, Tommy's one of them too. Um, so that to me, it's, it's a minor, you know, kind of, it's a, it's a random blip on the radar, but it just made me wonder that much more if Chad intercepted and said something harsh and definitive enough that Charles gave up. Like he didn't try calling Tammy that we know of. Um, and he just kind of assumed, well, she's, she's in it too. Okay. So that's, that's my presentation. If you want an ax, if you want access to it, you can go to bit.ly who's mole, M-O-L-E. All right. And as always, we will open it up for uh, some Q&A. But as I mentioned earlier, please let's uh, keep the Q&A um, limited to the topic at hand. Okay. Uh, and also just by way of reminder, or, or if this is your first live, one thing that really helps me is if you put the word question in all caps, you can put the whole question in all caps, that doesn't matter. But if you just at least put the word question in all caps, it will help your question to kind of stand out. All right. Yeah, uh, Patty Lee, that's that's what I suspected. That's what I suspect too. I suspect that Chad intercepted the email and as Tammy wrote back to Charles saying it's not true. This is, I'm reading what uh, what Patty wrote. Um, wrote back to Charles saying it's not true and Charles was crazy. So I suspect whatever it was, it was very harsh it was probably, you know, had a lot of this like kind of cult language and, and gave him a sense of futility, like, you know, resistance is futile sort of thing. But um, yeah. But I just, I just don't think it's reasonable to assume that Charles and Tammy would have had this conversation and Tammy would have been like, oh, oh, thanks for the heads up. And wouldn't have like all of this time wouldn't have been questioning things because you know, Chad was still like going on trips. Uh, even when we'll talk about uh, Zulema's trip out to Rexburg, 
she went out to Rexburg in September in between uh, Tylee and JJ's deaths. And I mentioned this in the last live uh, that Lori told Zulema that Chad asked her to send him a, a text message inviting him to her talk in like some other town. And I think it was probably in some other town just to justify like how long he was gone, um, you know, for like travel time and stuff. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. Uh, oh, but so, so we know that he was still telling Tammy like, oh, you know, like the Lord's work calls. And if Tammy had known about this affair and had been given all of this information, I think she would have been on high alert because there were two grave sites in on her property before she was murdered. You know, there were, I'm sure, lots of things that were suspicious. And we, I will have a, a live dedicated to Tammy and... Now that I'm on the other side of the live, I, I, one, one of the reasons, the, the most compelling reason I decided to do this live ahead of the other live with surprises from the FOIA docs was I just don't have a lot of opportunity to advocate for Tammy. One, most of the information about Tammy is going to come from Idaho and we don't have access to those FOIA docs. Like that's just not a thing. They handle FOIA docs. And by the way, when I say FOIA docs, uh, someone asked about that in a comment. FOIA is uh, just a, an acronym for Freedom of Information Act. So anyone from the, the press, anyone from the public really can request copies of information that has been slated as being um, uh, eligible to be accessed by the public. That's why there are all these redactions. One thing we see with Arizona though, is that they'll release one document that will be heavy, heavily redacted and then release a follow-up document that is very unredacted. Also, these FOIA docs uh, tend to be a combination of, uh, I'm assuming three different um, agencies because a lot of these documents, I'll find them in triplicate. Uh, but like one agency will redact something, but then another agency will leave it unredacted. And so, I mean, I've found phone numbers, email addresses, even a social security number, home addresses. I don't publish that information, but I do have uh, a Google Doc with all of this information uh, because it does help me kind of dig and. Um, learn more about some of these unusual findings in the FOIA docs, which uh, we'll talk about that next week. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Gabby's mom. Annie, do you have a date for the email Lori wrote posing as Charles? Yes. June 28th. So she sent that email to Chad on June 28th. And given how the email was written, it looks like Chad was the one who wrote the email because Lori writes in a very stream of consciousness writing style. Um, she's, and Chad's not a particularly engaging author, but he does have a fairly decent command of like grammar and things like that. So, um, so I suspect that Chad was the one who wrote the email, sent it to Lori, who then, um, you know, created this, uh, this fake account and sent it back to Chad. But yes, so June 28th, and Charles found it the next day on the 29th. No. Oh. No, uh, thank you, Moni, Moni, I'm not sure how, how to pronounce your name, but thank you. Uh, <laughs> Susan asked, do you think um, Wood knows this? 
Yes. <laughs> yes. I am sure that as information, you know, trickles um, out, I'm sure. There, and, and I've even been told, like, there's so much more information than what we even have access to. So, um, so yeah, I mean, like, I feel like even having gone through the FOIA docs, like, it feels like, okay, great. Now I have 38 pieces of a 3000 piece puzzle, you know? So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I really want to give a shout out to the reporters who so diligently requested these FOIA docs at the top of that list, because, you know, having gone through these, these FOIA docs, like in the first batch of um, documents that came out of Chandler, you know, uh, like, but I, I would read a page and organize it into different folders. And I had some subfolders. So I had a folder, uh, for just like interactions with the media and a subfolder of just all of the, um, FOIA requests. And, there were so many FOIA requests from Justin Lum that I could have the like the page really zoomed out because like when you go from page to page, like one page might be like really zoomed in, another page might be really zoomed out. But even if it was like really zoomed out, I just I recognized the logo. I recognized his signature, like even the the length of it, even when it wasn't readable. Like that's how many FOIA requests he had um, with uh, Garna Mieha, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, as a as a close second. So I mean, these the reason we have all of this information is that there, there has been a cloud of reporters who have just been pummeling law enforcement in Arizona with these uh, FOIA requests. So, yeah, so I mean, I couldn't do what I do without them. And then some of them have been generous enough to share the, the documents with me. So, um, so I really owe them a, a debt of gratitude and I need to ask them. I, I keep meaning to, if I like ask them for permission to share who has been sharing the documents with me. So I don't want to say that without, uh, without their permission, but, um, but yeah, some of them have been very kind to like pass them on and then it's, it's on like Donkey Kong. And I still haven't gotten through, like I've gotten through all of the text, but I haven't gotten through all of the interviews, like the audio files, um, uh, a lot of the pictures. I haven't gotten through all of those. So there's still a lot to kind of dig through. But my top priority was like the, the text. And like for some of the documents, they like the entire document is, it's just like one continuous stream of screenshots. So, and there's nothing you can do with a screenshot because it's like a picture of words. Like you can't search it. You can't put it in a dashboard. You can't run any kind of analysis on it, which I plan to do. Um, but, you know, they, it's just like trapped you know, like screenshots are like jail, you know? And, um, and so early on, like the lion's share of the work was in running, um, it's called OCR optical character recognition, I think, whatever, who cares. But, um, but that's the process of converting screenshots into live text. But anyway, so it's been a pretty exhaustive uh, process, but, but that was my top priority. OCR, the, the text, um, where, where need be, and then, you know, process that text and, you know, create screenshots and update the, the timeline and, and stuff. So, okay. Um, all right. Let's see if there are any other questions. Um, Mm. 
Oh, and that's a good question. She asks, are the recent FOIA docs out there for public consumption or only accessible to a few? So when one of the reporters shared, started sharing the FOIA docs, it was under the condition that I gave them adequate time and their news agency adequate time to cover the, the docs. And so we would actually meet up sometimes and like talk about what we found. And, um, but so because now multiple reporters have sent them to me, I just need to circle back and um, because one is still covering some of this information. So um, because I didn't order these, these documents myself, uh, um, yeah, I just want to make sure I've given each of the reporters adequate time. And so, but I will uh, circle back with them and, and just ask them. So. And, and these, these FOIA docs, they're, they're not cheap. Okay. Um, Oh, Annie said school employee emails are often Gmail accounts that can be ac accessed from any home computer or phone. That's a really good point because even if you are working with a branded email account, so like my site is analytics.com, if you set up a Google account with that email address, you can use Gmail. And so I have a business you know, um, Gmail account. So I'm still emailing from my analytics account, but I'm using Gmail. And one of the benefits is that I can, you know, log in on any device. So, you know, iPad, iPhone, you know, um, any computer. So, um, and I also suspect this is a little off topic, but, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, but I took a pretty deep dive into um, Tammy's life insurance policy. This was, I think, last year. Because one of the things I was really flummoxed by was I had increased my life insurance policy. And I had to jump through hoops of fire to get that approved. And in fact... In New, I'm not sure if it was New York City or maybe it was like within New York, they had like additional requirements for how something was notarized and like the, the notary stamp or the, I don't know, the um, boilerplate part, it had to be configured a certain way. And the document that the life insurance company sent me wasn't configured in that way. So... I was like, I had to go to several places. It just wasn't an easy process, you know? And so I was like, you know, like when, like, we, you know, we know that on, when was it? I think it was August 9th. I think it was the, the day Tylee's remains were, were buried on Chad's property. Uh, Tammy's life insurance policy was increased. I personally do not believe that Tammy did that. Um, some, some believe she did, you know, that she was just so trusting, such a kind, trusting soul. Uh, I, the reason I don't believe that she did is that I went to the website of her. We know that the policy was increased through her work account. So I did some digging and found out what company her school district used and I went to that site and I just pretended I was like a school employee and I had a policy and I was increasing the amount. I thought, well, I'll get as far as I, I get, you know, and I got pretty far. And so at one point it was like, okay, here's the form that you need to fill out. You can either mail it in. So you just sign it. You didn't have to have it notarized. And you could either mail it, um, email it, 
or there was another another option. I forget what the other option was, but I was just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, no notary. I mean, he was able to increase her pol policy. And I even like looked at the rules for increasing a policy and it couldn't um, like surpass, like a, there was like a, a multiple value. So they took the person's salary and, um, and it was like some multiple value of that. And it couldn't be larger than, than that amount, because we don't know how much that actual policy was for. They just kind of lumped in like her total life insurance policy. We will find out all of this at the trial. I'm sure. Excuse me. But, um, but yeah. And so, so, you know, like I went to salary.com to find out a rough amount of like what a school librarian would make and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But all he would have had to do and, you know, and Lori's family, like her dad and her mom, that's, that's the family business. And her mom started doing life insurance policy when Barry's um, license was uh, stripped from him for doing some sketchy stuff. So, you know, like it was a family affair. So they were pretty savvy when it came to life insurance stuff. So, um, so all Chad would have had to do was take a picture of Tammy's signature because I do this all the time. Like I so rarely ever print off a document, sign it with a pen and then scan it back in. Like the, the only time I have done that in probably the last 10 years, maybe was there was one time my accountant told me, no, the IRS wants a wet signature. I'm like, eh, that's, that's weird. <laughs> like, but, and yet the IRS is saying they're going to like move to like facial recognition or something crazy like that. Like they can't even handle digital signatures. We, and that technology has been around for a long time, but all you have to do is take a picture of your signature and you can do this in, you know, like if you're on a, Mac, it's the preview um, app. If you're on Windows, it's Acrobat uh, Reader. <clears throat> so they both offer this ability. But you just sign something, hold it up in front of your webcam and take a picture of it. And you can store that signature and it will even remove like the, the background, like whatever color the background is. So you just have like a transparent background. And so whenever I need to sign something, I just drop my digital signature and I have two and like, I'll just kind of switch them up a little bit, but, um, I also have my initials saved, you know? So, um, so that's all Chad would have had to do to, you know, have Tammy's signature on this, this form. So yeah, um, they, they need to lock this down. Like, it's 2022. I mean, too many spouses and family members have been murdered because of just, you know, just not having enough controls in place, you know, but um, now one thing that was a control, it was too loose of a control, but uh, the website said that you would get you you would get the answer within a certain number of days, and I'll I'll do a live about this. Um, I'm writing a lot of checks that I need to cash. Someone might need to remind me of all these lives I've said I do, but I mean we're going to be at this for a while now. Uh, but um, shoot, what was I saying? I get so off track. Um, I forget the point that I was making. Um, oh, yeah. So it, it said that she was going to receive a letter in the mail letting her know if, you know, the policy increase was approved. So clearly Chad would have been, you know, poised and ready to check the mail because he didn't actually work for a living. Uh, but there would also be an email sent to her 
work. It was either an email or a letter sent to her work. I think it was an e yeah, I'll cover that in the live. But there would be some notification sent to her work. So once they put that in motion, they only they they had a pretty narrow window uh, because it was pretty much inevitable or at least it was it was risky because I think it was actually yeah. I think it's actually a letter sent to her work, but I don't know. I'll have to double check that. If you're in the Cool Cats and Criminals group, I, I will look it up and, and drop it in the group, <clears throat> but um, even before the live. But, um, but yeah, it, at some point, she was going to receive notification that the increase had been approved. So it's a, they didn't have a, a lot of time, but all right. Um, okay. Let's see. Yeah, Amy, <clears throat> excuse me. She said, I wish we had more insight into Tammy's communication. I, I wish so too. I just so wish that I, yeah, I just so wish I could advocate for Tammy more, but I, I do look for any opportunity. Mm. Okay. Um. Yeah, Jenny, that's a good question. She asked, are we sure they failed to get the information from the school email? All of mine are archived by the county I work in to the cloud. Even on the old be up to 15 year old desktops. I question the same thing because, you know, if they were using Gmail or even if they were using an older system, I mean, it's, it's pretty standard fare to have some kind of cloud backup, even to like investigate employees and stuff. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, I, I, I question that myself and that we, we don't know. Um, Yeah, Diana asked, has there been any indication that Tammy found out about Charles' death and uh, then said some very kind things? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I. it doesn't appear that way. Um, you know, I think the Daybell family and the Cox family are, you know, were pr pretty different in their M.O., um, the, like I've mentioned before in other lives, the Cox family was very gossipy, you know, um, even when I was there, like I was led into details about like, you know, family stuff um, uh, for people I had never met. And um, so, you know, they're just a really cohesive unit. They have this solid MO of like, you know, kind of like just being like sharks kind of circling, you know, and they're going to stick together. Uh, their, their, their proclivity is to, you know, align themselves with family members. And so if you were the outsider because you married into this family and there's some kind of falling out, like you're pretty edged out. Um, so it, <clears throat> that, that's just like kind of the, the general way the family works. We don't really have an indicator. We don't have a whole lot of insight into the, the Daybell family. So, and we do know that Chad let Tammy drive to her parents' house. Now, I actually think, and I'm going to get a little bit more off topic on this. It's, it's somewhat related, but I actually think his entire 
point in that. Like at, at first I thought, oh, well, maybe he's giving her a chance to say goodbye. Nope. Nope. I don't think that there was any humanity in that whatsoever. There was an additional, I think it was a $2,000 writer. Might have been even more. No, there, it was more. There was a there was a writer on her policy because there was a death and mm, accidental death and dismemberment um, part of the policy. I think so. If she had died in an accident, I think he would have gotten an additional. It was like ten or twenty thousand dollars. And if she was driving and wearing a seatbelt, I think he would have received an extra $2,000. So when you think back to like different people, like uh, I think the woman's name was Angela Stone or something like that. She was Chad's friend um, and she had been interviewed by uh, Dateline. I'm not sure which episode that was. And by the way, if you have video of those Dateline episodes, please, please, please reach out because I don't, I don't have them. I have what well, no, I have the transcript, uh, for all of them, but I don't have the videos. I have a really, really low res, uh, that someone had recorded on their phone, um, for one of the episodes, but it, the, the audio is pretty bad and the resolution is really low. But having said that, uh, we know from Angela that, um, it, that Chad thought that Tammy was going to die in a car accident. And so did Lori. Lori thought that Charles was going to die in a car accident. And April Raymond, her friend in Hawaii, said that Lori told her when she flew out there that she, at first, April said that at first Lori said that Charles was already dead. Then she updated it to, he's not dead yet, but she was expecting a call any day. And he was supposed to die in a car accident. And then there's this back and forth between Lori and Zulema that is absolutely batshit crazy, where they thought they were going to be able to yield their murder prayers and run him off the road with JJ in the car. So... I suspect that Charles also had this death and dismembership and death and dismemberment, um, at, you know, writer or that that was baked into his life insurance policy. And who knows, maybe he also had a writer for wearing a seatbelt, but it would have been financially beneficial for both of them for their spouses to die in car accidents. So even during that time that Lori had, Charles car, which Charles had said was three days. I actually found out in the FOIA docs, it was one day. <clears throat> Excuse me. So still really bad. I mean, it's just, it's really bad form. But, um, but I, I've, I've always wondered if she had someone tamper with the car. Um, and that's why she was just so sure that he was going to die in a car accident. And I wonder if the same thing happened with Tammy's car, because now here's Chad, who, you know, according to others, other people's testimonies, wouldn't let Tammy drive far. And now here he is encouraging her to, you know, according to some dead ancestor that she needed to visit her family. So we know that she visited her family and, you know, clearly like she didn't leave him and they were surprised that she was murdered. So I suspect she knew very, very little. So I don't know how much some of his kids knew. Um, I, I do suspect some of them had a lot more information, but it, it, there are indicators that their loyalty appears to be much more with their dad than their mom, even judging by some of the social media posts that Emma had out there, like on Pinterest and Facebook, um, that were pretty denigrating toward her mom. You know, the passive aggressive kind of like, you know, um, Jason Mao operating under the assumption these were about her mom because they had, you know, 
um, like there was one that she posted to one of her siblings and it was like some kind of reminder of how Tammy would wake them up early on a Saturday. And, you know, it, it's just anyway. So um, I'll take a couple more questions and then I'm going to bounce. Um, let's see. Yeah, Beth, your question is kind of a variation on a theme. I don't think she ever knew who Charles was. Um, uh, was there ever a phone call between Tammy and Charles? No, I don't. I don't believe there was. We don't know for sure, but I mean, just common sense would say there would be at minimum, there would be a record of that. And that's not something you can delete. You know, we all get cell phone bills and there it is, the, the history of every call that we've made, you know, so they would be able to verify that they actually spoke, <clears throat> excuse me. And, you know, like I said, all of the indicators were that chat, Chad intercepted the call because then, I mean, for their theory to be, for Chandler police theory um, to be valid, you would have to assume that Tammy got the call, then talked to Chad, and then Chad gave Lori the, the heads up about the intervention. But, yeah. Yeah, Melanie, I see what you're saying to a degree. She said, um, you would be surprised at how supportive wives will be of their cheating LDS husbands. I don't know that I, I didn't, if I had read the LDS part, I, I actually wouldn't have read the question, but, um, I maybe in terms of like staying with him, but the lack of an indication of any kind of reaction, you know, like, I mean, like I said, even if Lori circled back around with her, it would have been at minimum 10 days later. So that would have been 10 days of, you know, angry tears and confrontations and going through his records. And, you know, especially if she met Lori, like now, you know, Lori lies very easily. So who knows if, if Tammy ever actually met her uh, and, you know, why she would have said Tammy was her friend. But um, yeah, so we just don't see at this point now, again, you know, when the, when the Idaho trials come around, we, I mean, we will be shocked. We, there, the amount of information that is going to be um, released is, is going to be impressive. I'm, I'm very confident of that. So, you know, like even in doing these lives, I, I realize like, I mean, we're two years in now, two plus years in, there are things that we thought for sure were fact early on, but the more information kind of trickled out, the more we found out, oh, wait, no, that's, that's not it at all, you know? And so like, for example, there, there was an email that was released to a member of the media that had the the email from, well, no, no, that's, that's too off topic. Uh, yeah, I'll cover it in another live. But anyway, um, my point being there's, I'm sure, you know, a lot of the, the things we're talking about now, um, you know, we're going to have more puzzle pieces and there will be things that I'll be circling back around on and saying, Oh, you know, this just in. So. All right. Let's see. 
yeah, so Tammy became a zombie and and had to go. Um, uh, Laura asked, do you think a fake Tammy took the phone call? Hmm. I, I mean, Tammy would have had to part with her phone. So it's, it's possible. Uh, there would have been a record that, well, yeah, I don't, I, Actually, no, I don't, I don't think it's possible because there still would have been a record of this call. So law enforcement would have assumed that they did speak because they would be able to see on her um, phone records that yes, they did speak on July 1st at this time. And the call was, you know, 26 minutes and and stuff and they specifically note that there's no indicator of how they how this conversation would have taken place so yeah no i i don't i mean you know i'm kind of like thinking on the fly here but my my knee jerk reaction is no i don't i don't think that that's um yeah i i don't think that that's the most possible explanation. I mean, this story is so crazy. Who even knows? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, question to any anyone, which episodes of 2020 is Annie? Oh, I'm looking for Dateline. So we have the 2020 episodes, but the first three episodes of Dateline it was like, where are the children? What happened to the children? And yeah, it, it was, they were all kind of variations on a theme. It's like, where Tylee and JJ or something like that. They were taken down, <clears throat> which is really unusual to me because, you know, I, I work in the marketing space. So that's a lot of re ad revenue. Um, so yeah, so I grabbed the snippets of, you know, like kind of key parts of um, these episodes. But yeah, once once they were taken down, it, yeah, I didn't I didn't have access. So then when I reference them, um, at least I I do have transcripts uh, with like minute marks and stuff. So I'll just use those screenshots and then it's up to people to believe if I'm ethical or not. I mean, I would absolutely never go in and change something. If there's one thing I've seen, even if I didn't have scruples or, or ethics or a conscience or, you know, an internal prosecuting attorney on, on retainer at all times, you know, like always questioning myself. Uh, if, if there's one thing I've seen in this case is, if you know if if you try to deceive like especially if you talk like if if i like had floated you know like some deceptive information the chances of being able to keep all of those stories straight are slim to none you know and um and that's the reason why i'm working on this other project of um it's a contradiction tracker and I published like a, um, a model of it in the group. Um, but it's just like taking kind of key questions and in, um, in, in a way that's easy to absorb, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, like we, it, it's called a, a radar graph, but like the question will be like a dot in the middle and then there will be spokes, um, radiating out from that dot with like all of the contradicting statements, either from a FOIA doc or someone's interview or, <clears throat> excuse me, something like that. 
Um, so yeah, and there are a lot of contradictions and that's really been kind of a group project for um, Cool Cuts because I just put it out to the group like, hey, you know, what are contradictions you've found in this case? And um, and then I go and like track them down and, you know, like I, I create like, you know, um, links to the screenshots. I create links to the citations and stuff. So you'll see if you join the group in the model, like when you hover over a dot, you'll see like the note, like what the claim the person has made, who made the claim, a link to the citation. And um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. That's a lot. But um, yeah, I mean, there, there are some questions where there are like five or six, you know, just uh, different nodes radiating out from a single question. So yeah, so ultimately that is what I'm working toward building because it's something that even if someone doesn't follow the case really closely or if they're just curious about a particular element, they can kind of, you know, zoom around and, you know, zoom in, zoom out and, or, you know, if they're on desktop, click around and kind of explore it and, you know, ultimately I hope to be able to have filters so you can filter by name or topic or, you know, things like that. So and I'll just be working on these projects <laughs> like, you know, ad infinitum. But um, uh, Paula, you asked, have I checked YouTube? I, I don't know what you mean. Uh, if you mean comments, I, I do pop in there. I try to pop in there like um, at least once a day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I have a, like, we have moderators kind of um, reviewing and kicking out the trolls. But um, if that's what you mean, yes. Uh, I really spend the, the, the lion's share of my time researching and pulling together the information for the lives, but I do want to build a community, you know, um, you know, like as a family member, I am very grateful that there are so many people following this case, you know, and as tragic as this case is, there is an element of privilege in that, like not every family not you know not every family who experiences like you know really terrible tragedy either gets justice or you know has has people who are, follow it and are contributing like so many people have dug into this case and have found things i mean that's why i ultimately started a group it was just so we could have a safe place with you know, there's not going to be no drama because humans are in it, but um, very, very low drama. We have a very low tolerance level for, for drama, but we have a lot of fun within those those bumpers. But I mean, the, the things that people catch they just blow me away, you know. And so, um, so yeah, I, I do want to build a, a community, you know, I, I want to pop in there uh, as much as possible. But my primary focus is you know, building the, the information and, you know, pulling together the information for these lives. That said, I am in a program uh, learning data science, and I am really behind on homework. So, um, so yeah, I need to get this a little bit under control. But okay. Uh, uh, Kristen asks, has Arizona police shown any progress slash desire on investigating Joe's death? No, but there was a discovery in the FOIA docs, which I will uh, talk about um, next week. So Joe did come up in the FOIA docs. Well, he's come up several times. There, there was one reference that was 
surprising. So, um, you know, so the, it's, it's yet to be determined. Like, I, I don't know, you know, like before this case, I used to follow true crime. Now I can't. Um, but I remember, and maybe someone will rem remember more of the, the details of it, but there was a case where a guy, like he committed these crimes. I think he, he came up to a car of like two teen, I mean, uh, two couples, they were teen couples out on a, uh, a double date. And I think they were in a drive-in, like they were at a drive-in movie. So I think it was in the fifties or something. And he, he, you know, he was awful. And, uh, and he ended up like shooting at police and he killed one of the police officers, but then there was never an arrest. And it wasn't until not that long ago, like they actually, someone came along and, you know, just opened up this cold case and they started working it again and they found out who it was. And I don't remember how old he was, but he was, he was up there. Like, I think he was at least in his seventies. Like he was a grandfather and shockingly he had never, he claimed he, he had never committed a crime after that. So they used that as an appeal to like, you know, not hold him accountable. Uh, but like, as an old man, he went to prison. And so, you know, I'm not a Pollyanna. I'm not like an eternal optimist. I'm very much a realist. And I do realize that like, they might not ever care, but I'm not going to stop advocating for, uh, for Phoenix police to, you know, to investigate Joe's death. And you just don't know, even in this case, who may end up flipping on others and you know and you know once someone flips i think <laughs> things will get really interesting so if someone is you know is able to to flip um i i think things will get interesting now i actually one of the side effects of going through the FOIA docs, I, I have less confidence that someone will flip because there are potential indicators that if Lori and Chad killed before, and there are indicators that, I mean, it's conjecture, but I'm going with it. I will share it in a live, but I believe there are potential indicators that both of them have have murdered before the, the ones that we, we see now. And if they actually shared this with each other, which I do believe that there is a possibility of that because of a, a really weird thing that Chad said, but if they did, like there wouldn't be any benefit for one of them to flip on the other because you know, they're, they're facing the possibility of the death penalty now. Uh, this is a capital case. But if they start flipping and we find out just how much they've done, then it goes from a possible, uh, you know, capital murder case to like, you know, any way you flip it, like they're, they're going to end up, you know, um, uh, experiencing the other side of a needle. But, um, so I, if they don't flip on each other, I do not believe it's because of love. I don't believe that either one of them are just lovesick and, you know, will die on their sword. I think probability wise, it's probably going to be their, their best option unless, you know, unless they're offered a, a deal, you know, like Zulema. So, um, like a, you know, a really good deal, but so yeah, who knows? Um, but yeah, so, you know, in that like flipping process and, you know, who even knows what will come out because of this issue of Lori not being able to keep a secret. Like that is something that, you know, I kind of hold on to. She, you know, here within six months of Joe's death, she was 
bragging about wanting to murder him to people she supposedly had just met. And then, then we find out that at, right after he was found dead, she's in Hawaii prattling on about how she paid her brother to murder Joe. Now, whether they were talking about 2007 or 2018, hello, like your friend whose ex-husband, who you know she hated, just died. And even if she was talking about 2007, which, I mean, that would be weird. Like, why would she brag about having paid her brother to murder Joe when it was unsuccessful, you know, and, and he went to jail? So, um, so I don't, I, I, be, I personally believe that's more revisionist story, but, um, but yeah, but it's just like, why, why wouldn't you come forward with, with information like that? So anyway, um, so, you know, the, the fact that she ran to Hawaii, she can't keep a secret. She will say outrageous things that you would think like if you're, uh, you know, like a murderess, um, you would keep these things to yourself. And she doesn't have the capacity for it. Like I said, in my first life, she has the self-control of a toddler. Uh, because I, I think she just is so intoxicated each time she gets away with something. So anyway, okay. Um, whoa. Butterfly23, uh, uh, she said, I think I have found five Dateline videos. I am downloading them now. Okay, uh, the email address is a murderous heart at gmail.com. I, uh, it, whoever passes these on, because I know the ones that I created beforehand, if you are amenable to me giving you credit, and I try to always give people credit. If I use something that someone else did, like I, you know, to really, really try to remember to always give someone else the, the credit, you know, for the finding. And even in my group, like we don't share things or at least it's a rule. Like you don't, you don't share something from another group without getting permission and, and giving the person credit. So, um, yeah. So I, if someone has those, I will give you credit you know, um, it, it would just be amazing. So yeah. Okay. Um, okay. One more question and then I'm going to go <laughs> eat dinner and work on homework. Uh, okay. I'm going to read this out loud. I should probably read it beforehand, but Annie, are you able to share why it was that Lori said to you that caused you to no longer be around her back in the day, the final straw, so to speak, if personal. I totally respect that. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. So there were things that were said and done on our 2007 vacation that, I mean, it, like I've said in, in other lives, there were so many aspects to this vacation that were really wonderful. You know, I mean, it was extravagant, it's very no expense. But they also, at that point, Joe had, his policy was from, he was required to have, I think it was like 325,000 on, um, like the, the, the state or the county required him to have that much. Um, and so, you know, I, I think they, I think they probably thought it was kind of an investment that would pay off. But having said that, there, there were a lot of wonderful aspects to it, but there were some things, some things I can't share just because like, you know, kids were involved. I can't tell my kids story. You, you, not that they've said, don't tell our story. That's just like, they know that they can trust me to keep things private. So, you know, and so there, there were some things that like be between the kids that were concerning. Um, and, and then, you know, I've, I've referenced this like really bizarre statement that Lori made that, you know, it was just, it was something that she 
said that members of her family did that, you know, it was, again, it was another indicator early on, like, it's, she just didn't have appropriate boundaries, or she was so, like, insular, like, so kind of, uh, like, border, I don't want to use the word inbred, no, I just, insular is a better term, but it's a little SAT ish, but, um, but their family was just so insulated. I'll use that word that I don't, I don't know if it was that, but it was, it was really inappropriate. And she said it so casually and, you know, and afterwards I was just like, oh my gosh, like what is up? with this family because there wouldn't have been any incentive for her to share this detail with me. And I certainly wouldn't lie about it. I mean, I haven't even shared it publicly and I, and I wouldn't, but um, so there's nothing to really lie about, but it, it did happen. And as I mentioned in the, the last live, there is a reference to something, I mean, like eerily similar, uh, that one of the people being interviewed had mentioned. So when I saw it in this document, it's not in public circulation. It will probably never be in public circulation, but um, I was just like, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I wasn't the only person she told about this. So that was a concern. There was also, um, she was so obsessed with like talking about Joe and there was there was one time where she um, she we were in the kitchen. That's not relevant. Sorry. Um, we we were just talking, and she told me about this threat that Colby had told her that Joe made to him. And you know, God is my witness on this again. Like there just wouldn't be any incentive for me to make this stuff up. I mean, this is it's. It's really bizarre, but this was a factor in just like, you know, I wanted to have a relationship with Tylee, but I also needed to protect my kids. And um, so, um, but she had, she told me that Colby told her, now he was, you know, very young at this time, so I don't hold him responsible for this, but um but Colby had told her that Joe threatened to, quote, explode his head in the microwave. So it stood out to me. You know, there's some things that are just going to stand out to you just because, like, you rehearse them so much. Or at least that's my tendency when there's something that's just, like, it just really stands out. And what stood out to me that was a concern was, like, you know, I had already testified. And um, so you know, for, for most adults, like if your child made a statement like this, obviously that would be impossible. Like you can't stick someone's head in a microwave and blow it up, you know? So that's like, you know, clearly this is a, a child getting caught up in the, you know, the fever of the moment and saying something that was outrageous. But she passed this on to me like it was fact. And um, so, yeah, so there, um, you know, I just, there, there were enough things that I, I just didn't want my kids exposed um, further. So, and I was a single parent. And um, so, you know, <clears throat> flying out would have would have been difficult. Um, there, there were other reasons for that, but so I'm not just trying to come up with excuses, but, um, but that also would have been awkward to, you know, say like, Hey, I'll come out because I want to spend time with Tylee, but you know, I, I don't want my, my kids there, you know? So anyway, so, um, so it was, you know, uh, yeah, but there, still was a huge difference between 2007 and 2018 because in 2007 uh, you know Lori was absolutely showing adoration toward 
both Tylee and Colby. So, and, um, and JJ hadn't been born yet. So there weren't concerns in terms of like her taking care of her kids. Like she never came across as homicidal or, you know, anything like that. Um, but yeah, it just wasn't. And like I said, in the last live, it's not like I'm backpedaling. Like, you know, I've read different comments and, you know, different places and, you know, people are like, oh, you know, she wasn't very transparent about her strained relationship with her brother. Like everything was like hunky dory until, you know, whatever they imagine. But that's actually not true. And there are people who were in the first group that I was in. I forget the name of it. It had a really dark name, but it was the, the precursor to WTAF. But um, it was something like it had, I'm pretty sure it had the word massacre in it, but you know, it was like deactivated, reactivated and, and stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. At one point I was blocked <laughs> from the group because I had deactivated my account. And anyway, so there, you know, it was, it was the first group that I was in and quite a few of the family members were in that group. But while I was in that group, there was something that had happened where, you know, and this reporter and I, we, we have since like made up mistakes were made. And, um, and this reporter was, was trying to, from my perspective, pressure me to go public bef before I was ready. And I had no intention of ever going public. I was active in the group, but I just didn't, I, I just didn't want this whole train wreck tied to my name. You know, I didn't want it tied. Yeah. I just, and besides I didn't have that much interaction with Tylee and, you know, and I told this reporter this, like I had so little interaction and my relationship with my brother was strained, you know? So I just didn't feel qualified. Like I felt sad, you know, but I didn't feel qualified to advocate for Tylee. And this person had said like, Tylee needs a champion, you know, and she doesn't have a champion. And, um, and it, it, it actually really made me mad because, you know, I used to be a reporter and I was like, this is a line, you're crossing a line. Like, you know, I agreed to speak to you on the, the basis of anonymity and, you know, like you're not supposed to pressure someone, but, um, but anyway, having said that, like, and I would never in a million years say who it was, like I said, mistakes were made, it's water under the bridge, but it is relevant because this, um, this person sent an email saying, Hey, I was reading through some documents and I saw a reference that Barry Cox made uh, that you testified against your brother. Is that true? And I had already told this person, like, lose my number, <laughs> you know? So, um, so to me, I may have misinterpreted it, but it came across as like kind of a veiled threat, you know, like this person had something on me and this is just, you know, for better or for worse, like, this is how I deal with, with stuff like this. But I was just like, oh, hell no. Like, no one is going to have anything on me because I don't have anything that I feel ashamed of, you know? And, um, and so within minutes, I went into the group and I said, I testified against my brother and this is why, because I was just like, no, I'm not going to have any cloud hanging over me. And you know, whether the reporter, you know, meant how I took it, I'll, I'll never know. And it's not, it's not relevant. You know, it does, it doesn't matter. Like we've all been learning through this whole thing. So, you know, to err is human, to forgive is divine. Not that I'm in any way divine, but, um, but I was very transparent and that was January 2020. So people ask questions and, you know, I had decided how much I would share and, you know, and I was walking a fine line because I believe that Joe was potentially a victim. Uh, you know, just thinking back to some of the things that Lori had said, and I've been very transparent about those things once I did come forward. But, and I was transparent even before I came forward, um, you know, uh, 
on, on Dateline. But, um, but yeah, so, but, you know, I didn't want to like cast a negative light on him, you know? And so I was walking a very fine line, but I erred on the side of transparency just so that like, there's nothing anyone could hold against me. So even when the FOIA docs, you know, were requested for the documents around um, Joe and Lori's divorce, and now I'm way off topic. So <laughs> if this isn't what you came for, good night, have a great night. But, um, but there were trolls who came after me. This was after I wrote an open-ish letter to Melanie Gibb um, after the, the kids' remains were found. Uh, and I mean, the accusations on Twitter, like the whole foundation of this attack. And there were, I, I don't want to exaggerate. I think, Janice, you might remember, I think it was more than 600 tweets from this one account within a two week period with like really hellacious allegations against me. No foundation. I mean, the only good thing was the person wrote on about a fourth grade level, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, said that I testified that my brother was, you know, um, a, a child molester, that I had a criminal racker. I mean, it just went on and on. Like no low was too low for, for this person. And there was someone in the group that I was in at that time who I believe figured out who this troll was. And so um, that, that eventually, thankfully, put, put an end to it. But the whole foundation of this troll's belief was that only a family member, she believed, I believe it was a she, uh, she believed that I had to be the one to order these FOIA docs. And even though the ladies with WTAF, which I give them credit every time I talk about those FOIA docs, because they put out their own money to order these, these documents. And even with them saying, like from their account, like Annie had nothing to do with this. I had a 20 minute heads up in the group that I was in at the time that in 20 minutes they were going to release these documents. That that was it. I mean, I was I was shell shocked. I had no idea at that point just how much information could be released. I, I had never seen anything like this. Um, but, uh, and my days as a reporter predated a lot of this, like, you know, it predated the, almost predated, predated the internet. But, um, but anyway, so yeah, so this person just saw only a family member could order these documents. And so I must have been the one to order these documents. But when they came out, like I even told one of the producers who, you know, was like digging through these documents. I was because this person thought like when no one found references to my testifying against Joe, you know, then she assumed that like I was the one who ordered these documents. And then I like surreptitiously went in, removed references to testifying against Joe and then released the, the documents. But, you know, I took the coward route and released them through someone else. And anyone who's followed me for any length of time, I just would never do that. Like, I literally have never made so much as a single comment using like a sock puppet account or anything. Like if every single thing that I have said about this case publicly or in Facebook groups has been only through verified accounts. So that's just not, you know, I have many, many other issues. That's just not one of them. So anyway, so all, all that uh, to say, I have been transparent about the issues uh, with, with Joe and, and even my own process of, you know, when we had our, our falling out, you know, I hadn't even started therapy myself. And so, um, yeah. So anyway, whatever, that, that was a long explanation, but I mean, it, it was kind of a loaded question. So on that, uh, on that naughty note, not, not naughty, like naughty, like a tree, tree branch. All right. Never mind. It's late. 
Um, thank you for joining the live tonight and have a great night and weekend. And we will meet back Friday, nine o'clock, same time, same channel. Good night.